Hello, good morning. Um, my name is John Apostolikis and I will tell you about uh, the role of particular types of simulation in, in our society today. I think it's maybe echoing a little bit hard. Okay. Um, I will tell you primarily about a particular type of simulation, the type that I work in, and its application outside of our lab here at CERN. But I, I would like to go back to a, a different type of simulation to explain what simulation is. I think there are probably only older people who do not know what Angry Birds is, uh, an application on many mobile platforms and the web. Uh, but it's a simple example to explain what simulation is. You take a physical system, in this case an imagined system, where you have uh, objects which you hurtle through its space. Uh, you have a setup, and in, in that system you model how different components uh, interact. For example, when the, when the ball or whatever it is you're chucking at this poor construction uh, is going through the air, it, it uh, undergoes a parabola, a simple equation, uh, which many of you will remember from uh, high school physics. You model these equations, then you, it hits an object, it imparts some momentum, it knocks it a little bit, that object is tied up to other objects. You evolve the state of this system. From this, you extract results. In this case, the results are basically entertainment. In other cases, they are a lot more serious uh, and, and interesting, and I'll try and explain you uh, some of these results that you can get with the types of simulation that we do at this lab and at other labs with which we collaborate or which take the tools that we work on and uh, use them for other purposes. There are many, many different things that one can simulate. One can simulate a smartphone actually running this app. You develop it on a Macintosh computer like the one that I have right here making this projection, and then you emulate what happens on a smartphone. You can simulate a car crash. You can simulate uh, the engine of a car, you can simulate a pacemaker, you can simulate the traffic in, in a city or in a whole country. I will talk about nothing like these things on the left. These are important, but they're outside my sphere of expertise. However, you can also simulate what happens when a cosmic ray hits the atmosphere. I'll show you uh, an example of this and, and explain a little bit about the type of simulation and why it's relevant. You can simulate what happens to the electronics in a satellite when it's in Earth orbit uh, and it goes through the radiation belts. I'll show you a little bit about these and how they're simulated. I'll sh uh, also, you have to predict what happens to a satellite when it goes to a different planet. There is a, a, a huge mission from the European Space Agency which will be sent out to Jupiter. Uh, if I recall correctly, it'll be sent out in about, it'll start off at about nine to uh, 10 years. You have to build all the machinery that goes in that satellite so that it will withstand the very harsh radiation environment uh, in that planet. You heard in the previous two talks, if you were here, uh, about medical detectors and uh, some of the advances of using antimatter in, in these medical detectors. Um, there are many other things that are being done today to improve them. I'll explain a little bit about how simulation is used for that. Uh, and also simulation is used for radiation treatment. Um, one of the ways in which we started to understand more and more about uh, particles that nature has is cosmic rays. And this is a simulation of a very high energy cosmic ray. Apologies for the fact that in a non-darkened room it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see the central core. Uh, and this is, an, this is a cosmic ray that has energy uh, a few billion times the energy of the LHC. These have been detected. Typically, they do not occur very often or very frequently over any, any single point in space. You're much more likely to be hit by lightning uh, in uh, one year than you are to see one of these events in uh, a lifetime. However, in order to understand what happens to an event like this and measure it well and try and understand what its origin is, and this is an extraordinarily high energy particle, one that we don't understand, you need to build a code that will simulate it that will simulate the physics of the first interaction, which is similar to the physics uh, of, that happens in interactions in the accelerators here at CERN. And then you need to simulate the, the showering 
after the first interaction, which will generate a few particles, these particles will interact again and again and again and again. And you see this, uh, what we call a shower of, of, of uh, particles or a shower of radiation. Uh, it is also important not just to understand the universe, for these extremely high in energy and rare particles are uh, at the forefront of research, but it's also important because more mundane particles bombard the top of the atmosphere at any time. And just as a particle in a detector will shower and, and start to create more and more little particles, you should be able to see a little bit pinpricks of black and red in this, are tools, the tools that we build try and simulate both of these things, both the showering in the atmosphere, what happens in a simple detector, whether it is a detector here uh, in Atlas CMS or one of the other LHC experiments, or whether it is something that happens in the atmosphere or in a medical detector. The different types, I try to list a few of the different types, the effects of solar events on satellites, protons in the treatment center. I'll show you examples for each one of these. Uh, and our colleagues earlier spoke about the use of positrons in medical imaging. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done on the simulation of these devices. The Earth's atmosphere uh, is one of the things that we have to protect us, but also the magnetic field is, is an important factor in protecting us from the solar radiation, the protons that the, that the sun emits, uh, and understanding how particles uh, are kept away from the Earth most of the time, of course, they're, they're, they can penetrate at the poles. And also what the effect of the trapped particles in, in near-Earth orbit is on satellites means that you need to model the, the magnetic field of the Earth. This is a program, I'm showing you pictures from a program called Planeta Cosmics, which is based on the Giant 4 toolkit which I work on. This tool was created with uh, funding from the European Space Agency and it shows particles spiraling around the Earth in the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, it's also used to understand how high energy a particle must be in order to penetrate from the top of the atmosphere and arrive down on the surface of the Earth with zero energy. Particles above that energy will all, will all actually arrive. Particles below that energy will be stopped within the atmosphere. And that depends a lot on the latitude, on where the sun is, how active the sun is, because all of these shape the, the magnetic field of the Earth, and thus they shape how easily particles can actually come down uh, from the sun down to the Earth. It's also used, uh, programs like these are also used to understand what happens on other planets. In this case, uh, a mission to Mercury uh, is, has been planned, and the, the modeling of, of a very weak magnetic field, which is, uh, understood to be in, on Mercury, is modeled a proton which comes from the direction of the sun here on the right, uh, hits the model planet. Uh, that causes some interaction which causes particles to be emitted backwards out into the, uh, let's call it atmosphere of, of, the, of the planet, uh, which I think is very, very, very weak. And these particles, although they were emitted at the surface, will be will move around in the atmosphere of the planet and will go, will do many revolutions and have very, very unusual tra uh, trajectories. Uh, sometimes, of course, they will hit again the, 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 sorry, the, uh, the surface of the planet. Here you see in green there are electrons, in blue there are positrons that were generated from the impact of this original proton. A proton is a hydrogen nucleus. Uh, and some of the higher energy particles that, that came from this attract in this program and, and you see it. Now, of course, there's very heavy simulation of what happens in the, um, the vicinity uh, in the radiation belts of Jupiter because of the missions that will be going there. The point of actually looking at what happens on, from the impact of particles on Mercury's surface is that, what, is that the results of these interactions will produce something which can be seen by an instrument on a spacecraft near the, near the planet and thus and you can understand what the composition of the surface of the planet. So in this case, it's research about the surface of, of other planets in our world, uh, in our solar system, excuse me. Um, I mentioned the importance of, of protecting satellites from the radiation environment of the Earth. Uh, this shows a different um, event. This is 
a coronal mass ejection which happened in 2001, sorry, in 2000, this one, uh, a satellite which is observing the sun um, is seen here. It measures this one um, showing you the coronal mass ejection as it happens and then you can see the picture start getting granular. That is because high energy particles which were emitted by the sun actually start hitting your detector and instead of seeing the light and the frequencies that you actually want to measure it at, you see the fact that your detector is showered and everything in it is almost lit up at the same time. This shows you that the satellites are vulnerable not only to the radiation environment of the Earth, which is produced, of course, in, in good part by the sun, uh, in trapped particles, but also to direct um, events which are important for understanding. And since satellites are very important for uh, communications, for many Earth observation, and for many other missions, uh, their health is also a matter of uh, uh, some importance. Finally, uh, as far as space applications of simulation are concerned, the mission, there is a manned mission to Mars which is in, in, the, in the planning, early planning stages, both from the European Space Agency and NASA. The environment of uh, Mars is rather harsh, a weak atmosphere, um, almost no magnetic field. The effect that the radiation from the sun would ha and and from uh, other sources would have on, um, on astronauts in the passage from here to Mars, designing a spacecraft which would allow them to survive if, if uh, an event like the one I showed you previously actually happens during their transit, um, and also how they would survive for some time on Mars. These are things that one can simulate before. One can understand the, the environment uh, that one has measured the, the radiation environment on Mars, but one can project uh, a worse space weather or, or other conditions. Then one can project how to build a habitat, a habitat as in a place that they could stay for days or weeks, likely by burrowing down and having soil on top of them that would provide the same type of, of protection that our atmosphere provides for us. In the case of the, the spacecraft, uh, the idea is to, to try many different ways of having magnetic fields that might help shield, but mostly to have the astronauts sleep inside their water tanks. They have a, a cylindrical shield which has water. Water has hydrogen. Hydrogen typically stops uh, many of the charged particles. But you can explore these ideas without having to build uh, five designs of spacecraft and expose them to a, to a laboratory here, radiation, and measure how good they are. You can do it in, in, a, sim in a simulation. A more mundane and everyday use of simulation is to try and understand the, the effect of radiation on aircraft, and in particular on air crew, that is people who not only have to go up once every week, month, uh, and travel, but they have to, to travel almost daily as part of their work. Because the, the cosmic rays which arrive at the top of the atmosphere interact and shower, I showed you earlier how they do this, the maximum of radiation actually is at 10, about 10 kilometers, between 10 and 20 kilometers, and that is, of course, where airplanes fly. If they fly to South America, they're also exposed to, to um, around Rio de Janeiro. Uh, there is what's called the South Atlantic Anomaly. That's a place with, uh, where, because of the peculiarities of the Earth, the elliptical shape, at, 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 at lower heights you will get a lot more radiation. So people have to understand, worry, measure, and predict how much this effect will be, and make sure that air crew are not exposed to this unnecessarily or not exposed to, to uh, doses which are harmful for them. Um, there's a program called Avidos based on a toolkit called, or a tool called Fluca, which is also uh, worked on by CERN and the Italian Nuclear Space Agency, which is used heavily in this regime. I mentioned earlier the, the fact that uh, um, protons are used, sorry, that there is, radiation is used for treatment of cancer. You heard about it about an hour ago. Um, I, I will not get in depth about this, but I'll also explain a little bit about how you can utilize simulation programs to actually improve what is delivered for patients. In, in particular, 
the, a facility has many different things that will tune the beam which is applied to a patient. In this case, it's a proton beam, and this is a, an apparatus which will uh, separate the beam. You can see in the background uh, there are pieces which are moving, and what happens is that it, it allows them to, to go through some part of the time, and it doesn't allow them to go through another part of the time. Um, a whole The whole apparatus, you can see the whole apparatus here in a fly-through. There are the wheels that you just saw earlier, which are modulate the beam. That is, sometimes allow it to go through a lot and sometimes little. In between, there are plenty of pieces which are collimate the beam, which only allow it to go through in particular locations. And here, there's a piece that's adapted exactly to the patient. It's made such that it will, it will stop most of the particles that will go through, most of the protons that would be going through to a particular part, and it will slow down the others so that they actually impart their energy exactly where the tumor is, and they don't go another centimeter further, whether it might be some very important tissue like a brain, lung, heart, whatever it is. The last piece here on the left, the, the special one, is adapted to every single patient. This is a, something that is actually being used. This device that, that, that is modeled here is built by a Belgian company, is being used in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts General Hospital to treat patients, and this is a simulation that's utilized to actually understand whether what is planned using another tool, which is faster, actually delivers the dose where it's needed and doesn't hurt the organs which are nearby. So simulations are run, <coughs> excuse me, simulations are run typically over several hours. The patient, so that you check the, the planning of the, of the treatment that you will give the next day. Excuse me. You heard earlier about uh, the use of antimatter in medical imaging to try and understand um, what parts of a particular organ are functioning well. Uh, in, in, this, in that case, the brain. Position emission tomography has been greatly developed over the last years, and simulation is playing a part today in designing better instruments. Um, my son had to, under, when he was two years old, had to, uh, sorry, when he was six months old, and then when he was two years old, had to go and undergo an exam. The equipment uh, which was utilized meant that he had to be held still for 20 minutes. He was six months old. In, this was in order to understand whether his kidneys were functioning well. Today, potentially, the same exam might happen in three minutes because we have improved the detectors and thus you, the patient can stay much less time or you can get better resolution and see things much better. The tools that are used for this purpose also nowadays are advanced enough that you can see things which are moving. Uh, so for example, you can deal with <coughs> well, I can't deal with getting it to move again. But you can deal with breathing, which is something that moves all the important organs. Um, and you can have a model of a detector, which actually allows you to, to see the organ which is moving, which is actually what you want to measure. Emitting the, mod, you model it, emitting the, the uh, positrons, emitting the gamma rays that come from that, seeing how many actually come to what, where you can measure. And since you're modeling it, you can try one, ten, a hundred, a thousand different configurations until you found one that has the highest efficiency and allows you to get both either a better picture using the same amount of time or get the same quality picture a lot faster. So I've tried to give you a, an idea about the role of simulation in a, a few particular fields similar to the one that I work in. You can run experiments using it to, to understand a device before it's built whether this device is uh, the detector of an LHC experiment, whether it's a positron emission tomograph tom uh, tom uh, tomographic device, or anything similar. You can design and optimize new devices that you've 
decided you, you, you will probably want to build, but you don't have to spend a few hundred thousand or a few million dollars to build a, a complicated device uh, and then find out that you should have done it a slightly different way in order to make it better. You can understand things that are either hard or impossible to measure or simply things that you, you are going to measure, but you want to make sure that you have your instrument is, is, uh, will survive the measurement or will, will do a decent job. And finally, you can use it to aid in analyzing and understanding very complicated results. When you make a, a medical exam using one of these things, you want to understand whether you've measured things well or not. You don't want to get something where, where the first time that you measure it, you get one result, the second time you get another, the third time you get another because you're not measuring it well enough. Similarly in, in experiments uh, like the experiment that we have here. And then you want to predict, you want to plan, you want to use it in many different ways. So I hope I've given you a, a first idea about w what simulation, the role that simulation can play both in our field and in fields which utilize the same type of thing for radiation treatment or for medical devices which will image your body or generally and to understand the role of, of particles and radiation in the atmosphere today. Thank you very much.